When people hear the word grace, they usually think of Jesus. And there's no wonder, they go hand in hand. Grace and Jesus, they've been blended in religious music and writing. However, grace is one of those church words that often goes undefined. We could say at least that it goes underdefined. We've all heard grace defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. We've heard that, that anywhere you see the word grace, you could, you could substitute the word Jesus. And, and I think that fundamentally that is true. Even though Jesus is full of grace, this is just too simple. Let's take a moment this morning and define biblical grace. Let's look at some ways that God's grace impacts our lives. How can we become more gracious in our pursuit of 5G Christianity? In general, grace is defined as favor. It's really just favor from one person to another. In ancient Greece, it was particularly kindness given from a person of superior position to a person of inferior position. In the New Testament, grace is used in a redemptive sense. God makes his favor available to undeserving sinners. And brothers and sisters, that's all of us. You and me are undeserving sinners. We're all guilty of breaking God's law. Look at Romans chapter 3. And verse 9, Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. None are righteous, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. We're all sinners who deserve death. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were enemies of God. That's where we all started, as enemies. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. Colossians 1 and verse 21. And although... You were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Do you understand? We were enemies because we were alienated. We, are, we were enemies because we were hostile in mind. We were enemies because we were engaged in evil deeds. And as a result, we were in peril. But he saved us from ourselves. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, a very familiar passage Paul said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We are rescued because of the grace of God. Grace gives us victory over sin. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 6. In James chapter 4 and verse 6. James writes these powerful words, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace gives eternal comfort and good hope. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 16. And, and I know we, we looked at this verse very recently, and I think I may have actually called it a sleeper passage. And it's amazing in your study of the Bible, how a passage can be a sleeper passage, and then you wake it up, and it just seems to come up everywhere you're studying. It seems to be relevant in all of your your study of God's Word. But in in 2 Thessalonians 2, and verse 16, Paul says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. I just want you to understand, grace is a beautiful gift given by our benevolent and mighty God. His grace is the source of our salvation. All that we have is from Him. Now, 
How do we imitate this? We mimic God by being gracious to others. Our grace does not have the saving power of God's grace, but grace is even broader than the gift of salvation. It includes all good and beautiful blessings given to us that we do not deserve. And so today, we will explore how we can bless those around us with grace. God's grace offers us an opportunity for acceptance. Most of us spend our entire lives trying to earn acceptance from our parents, from our peer group, from our partners, from people that we respect, and even from people that we envy. We spend a lot of time trying to gain acceptance. The desire to be accepted permeates our choices about clothes, about the cars that we drive, about the careers that we choose. Kids are often up for a good dare if it will get them accepted by the group. Now, now just think about perhaps, maybe not for you, but for me, the list of dumb things that you've done to be accepted by your peer group. You have to be able to identify with that at some level. Have you ever said to a parent, but listen, everybody is doing it. Look, look when you make a statement like, like that, it, it should remind you of your fundamental need to be accepted. This year, Capital One came out with um, a commercial of a bunch of little kids on a playground getting ready for a pickup game, Brent. And they were choosing sides. And they were all grammar school kids except for one fellow. You know who it was? Hall of Famer Charles Barkley. And so here's a little girl, and she's going to pick the team, and a little boy, and he's going to pick the team. And the girl has first pick, and she says, as she looks at the line of kids, I choose Barkley. And Barkley says, yes, I still got it. Here's this Hall of Fame athlete who, and I know it's just a commercial, but, but I believe there's a truth in this, who still wants to be accepted. It feels good to be accepted. Our God is a God of acceptance. When we choose to follow God, he accepts us into his family and he calls us his own. And David knew this. Look at Psalm 21 and verse 10. Psalm 21 and verse 10 says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. You know what that tells me, brothers and sisters? That God trumps our parents. And I'm so glad that he does. Because as much as my mom and my dad loved me, and as much as they have done for me, their love and their support pales in comparison to our God. Peter explained how we belong to God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And I know I often use this passage to talk about evangelism, but that's not the point this morning. This morning, I want you to see from this passage just how much you mean to God. But you are a chosen race. God chooses us. A royal priesthood. We have position. A holy nation. We've been set apart. A people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Christians are chosen people and God chooses you. If you are a New Testament Christian today, you are a New Testament Christian because God chose you. God describes his love for his people in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, Jeremiah wrote here, The Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore... I've drawn you with loving kindness. Our God's love is everlasting. 
God is not indecisive and unstable. God is not like some relationships you might have had that are on again, off again, where you may have felt as though you've been dropped, never to be picked up again. God is not indecisive and unstable. James 1.17 describes our God as constant and steady. God's amazing grace offers us acceptance. So how do we give accepting grace to our brethren? Look at Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. You understand, we're to be of the same mind. We don't want to spend our time figuring out what makes us different. We want to spend our time identifying those things that we have in common. Verse 6 says that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This emphasizes the unity that should exist among us. God accepts us. We are to accept one another. Verse 7, wherefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Paul encourages the Romans to remember how God welcomed them. Welcomed them. Exclusivity and snobbery should have no place in the church. We are not an exclusive group. We're an inclusive group. We don't want to behave in such a way that people would think that we're snobs. This should be the kind of place that when people walk through those doors, no matter where they're coming from, that they feel welcomed here. John makes a very clear statement in 1 John chapter 5, pardon me, chapter 3 and verse 15. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. John says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That is a striking statement. Have you compared hate to murder? Look, the fact of the matter is, whether you have or not, the Scripture does. John did. The Holy Spirit of God carried it in this particular manner. And if you have hate in your heart, it is like unto murder. And you know that no murderer has a place in heaven. It seems bizarre to talk about hating our brethren, but, the, but again... We have to accept the fact that this, this exists. It exists among the people of God. That there are brothers and sisters in Christ who can't get along even to the point of hating one another. Focusing on our acceptance and love for each other will combat hate. Remember that God shows no partiality. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul says that very thing. For there is no partiality with God. We should also strive to be impartial people. As 5G Christians, we, sh we strive to be more gracious in our acceptance. God's grace offers us an opportunity, number one, for acceptance. And number two, God's grace offers us an opportunity for adjustment. Now, hang in there with me on this one, okay? Whip is a crocheting term. Now, I want you to know I don't know anything about whips, and I don't know anything about crocheting. I had help on this point. The fact of the matter is that as I was sharing this point on adjustment with Jennifer, she said, look, this will, this will be a great illustration. And I was like, Jennifer, that might be a good illustration for a ladies' Bible class, but I'm not sure how that's going to work for me. Well, as she explained it, it made a lot of sense. WIP stands for working in, uh, work in progress. 
Crocheting oftentimes is a work in progress. And God began a good work in us, and he will bring it to completion. Look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says, For I'm confident. I'm confident of this very thing. What, Paul? What is it that you have confidence in? That he that is our God who began a good work in you, that is the church in Philippi, will perfect it until the day of Christ. God has begun a good work in each of us, and he will carry it on until the, res- until the return of his son. The New Testament encourages us to grow. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And, and as, I, as I heard Tommy read that passage this morning, it occurred to me, I probably should have include, included verse 17 in the scripture reading. But in 2 Peter 3, verses 17 and 18, Peter said, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard lest being, being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Growing in grace means we avoid being deceived. We don't have to worry about the error of unprincipled men. Growing in grace means we can enjoy stable footing. And so we're not going to fall from our own steadfastness. And growing in grace means that we're able to glorify Jesus. Did you catch the last part of verse 18? It says, to him be the glory. Glory goes to God when we grow in grace and knowledge. God's grace enables us to grow. It allows us to fight the sin in our lives and to pursue him. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Titus 2, 11 and 12, this is one of the most remarkable passages to me in all of the Bible. I love Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, amen, that God has allowed his grace to appear, bringing salvation to all men. Salvation is available to all, but they have to accept this offer that God has given. What does grace do? Verse 12 says that grace teaches. God's grace instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, Righteous, righteously and godly in this present age. It affords us transformation as we are honest with God and ourselves. God's grace can really change our lives. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. John says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a transforming power to God's grace, but we have to acknowledge our sin and we have to make the confession to God of that sin and then God can transform us. God's amazing grace offers us adjustment. So how do we give our brethren room for adjustment? It really starts with how we think of others. If you're going to extend the grace of adjustment to others, you're going to have to change the way you think about others. Your gracious encounter with brethren or family member never starts at that encounter. It just can't. It has to start way before that, way before the incident. Paul says to respond to others in a Christ-like manner. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, 
maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do you understand? You don't do that in an instant. That doesn't happen at the moment of encounter. We have to change the way we think of these people. In verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each one of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do you usually know when you'll run into a Christian that needs adjustment? I would suggest, of course you do. You know when you're going to run into someone who needs a little help. You know when you're going to have an encounter that won't necessarily be pleasant. Do the gracious work of allowing them to grow and change by determining to value them the way God values them. You see, that's the whole key, is understanding that they belong to God just like you belong to God. That Jesus died for them just like Jesus died for you. In Romans chapter 14, Paul writes that the weaker brother is to be accepted. The weaker brother is to be encouraged. And and this is not anything goes way of thinking. That's not what I'm suggesting. It's an honor one another to make each other better way of thinking. It's a give them room to grow way of thinking. As 5G Christians, we strive to be more gracious in our adjustment. God's grace offers us an opportunity Again, number one, for acceptance. Number two, for adjustment. And number three, for absolution. We've already touched on some of the ways that the grace of God offers us salvation. We're saved in no other manner than submission to Christ, which allows us to receive forgiveness and mercy. God's amazing grace offers us absolution. So how do we give the gift of absolution to our brethren? Let me offer three fundamental suggestions. First of all, return a blessing for a curse. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 14, Paul says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and curse not. He tells you what to do twice. He tells you what not to do once. Bless. Bless and curse not. Brothers and sisters, that's forgiveness. That's what it looks like. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Again, that's forgiveness. That's what it looks like. Bless your enemies. Look at verse 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Once more. That's forgiveness. This is what forgiveness looks like. And we have the ultimate example in Jesus in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 where Paul said, Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Where do we get the motivation to reach down within ourselves in a place that we don't like to go and extend forgiveness to someone who has hurt us? We go to the cross. That's where we go. We go to that place where God has made forgiveness available to us. And our beautiful example of forgiveness can motivate us to be gracious and forgiving to others. But what about when you're right? What about when you're being unjustly accused? We're called to graciously bear the weaknesses of the weak. Turn back to Romans chapter 15. Verses 1 through 3. Romans 15, verses 1 through 3. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. You see, being a Christian 
is all about considering others before yourself. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul urged in Philippians 2 in verse 3. And that's what he's saying here in Romans 15 in verse 1. Let each, let each, one, let, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell upon me. That's what Jesus did. And I love Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, where the Hebrews writer says, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all ways, like unto his brethren, yet without sin. It seems certain to me that Jesus must have been tempted not to forgive. It's possible you're tempted not to forgive. But God's absolution for us makes our absolution of others easier. You see, when you reach down and you go to that place that you don't like to go, you have to remember how much God has forgiven you. And that should, that should then motivate you. That, that, that should help you find within yourself the ability to absolve others. Our absolution of others can turn their faces toward God and, and encourage them to do better in their own lives. We know that love covers a multitude of sins. That's what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. And so absolution is possible for everyone. And it's possible for everyone to extend it to others. And so this morning, as, as we conclude this series of lessons on 5G Christianity, I, I believe that I've saved the best for last. Grace is what Christianity is all about. Grace can be defined by just saying Jesus. And I want you to know this morning that if you are not a New Testament Christian, the, manifest, the manifestation of God's grace can come in three ways. It can come in acceptance. And as I've already said, we're all looking for acceptance. You need go no further than our God. Our Father God wants to accept you this morning. And if you're thinking, well, listen, I'd like to receive that kind of acceptance. I really would. I'd like to be in a group of people that would accept me. But I'm not sure that I can make the adjustments Brothers and sisters, we all have adjustments to make. We still have to make them. We'll always have to make them. And with God's grace, I don't care where you are in your spiritual life, God can help you make adjustments. And ultimately, absolution, forgiveness is possible. And with it, a peace that passes all understanding. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord, we hope you'll make your need known this morning. If you are a child of God, you know these truths. Acceptance. Acceptance is there. Adjustment. It's there. Absolution. It's there. If you're subject, you have any need at all, won't you let it be known as together we stand and sing the song select.